Treasury Star Parade. Produced under the personal direction of William A. Bacher, with Miss Lynn Fontan, Al Goodman and his orchestra, and Henry Hall as our master of ceremonies. This is Henry Hall, ladies and gentlemen, with another of the programs brought to you by the Treasury Department. And now, if I may be permitted to start with a personal observation, we all have our favorites in the theater, on the concert stage, in motion pictures. But I have only one favorite. To me, she is the most gracious, most charming person on the American stage. I know her husband, too, and I know that he agrees with me. At this time, I feel that we are singularly fortunate in having obtained for our vehicle a few of the most dramatic scenes from Alice Dewar Miller's poem, The White Cliffs of Dover, and for our reader, Miss Lynn Fontaine. loved England dearly and deeply since that first morning, shining and pure, the white cliffs of Dover I saw, rising steeply out of the sea that once made her secure. I had no thought then of husband or lover. I was a traveler, the guest of a week. Yet when they pointed the white cliffs of Dover, startled I found there were tears on my cheek. I have loved England and still as a stranger. Here is my home and I still am alone. Now in her hour of trial and danger, only the English are really her own. It happened the first evening I was there. Someone was giving a ball in Belgrave Square. I went up the stairs between them all, strange and frightened and shy and small. And as I entered the ballroom door, someone beside me turned and smiled. I needed a friend and he seemed kind. So I put my gloved hand into his glove. And we danced together and fell in love. I did not see my life was changed, utterly different, by this love estranged forever and ever from my native land, that I was now of that unhappy band who lose the old and cannot gain the new, however loving and however true to their new duties. I could never be an Englishwoman, there was that in me, Puritan, stubborn, that would not agree to English standards, though I did not see the truth because I thought them, good or ill, so great a people, and I think so still. But a day came when I was forced to face facts. I was taken down to see the place, the family place in Devon and John's mother. Quiet she was and so at ease, so perfectly sure of her rightful place in the world that she felt no need to please. I did not like her. She made me feel talkative, restless, unsure, as if I were a cross between parrot and eel. I thought her blank and cold and stiff. I saw the house with its oaken stair and the Tudor rose on the newel post, the panelled upper gallery where they told me you heard the family ghost, a gentle, unhappy ghost who sighs outside one's door on the night one dies. I remember politely thinking... Not I would hear one midnight that long, sad sigh. I saw the gardens after our tea, crumpets and marmalade, toast and ale. I saw the picture of every son, Percy the eldest and John and Bill in Chinese customs, and the youngest one, Peter the sailor, at Osborne still. A little thing happened just before we left. The evening papers came. John, flicking them over to find a score, spoke for the first time a certain name, the name of a town in a distant land, etched on our hearts by a murderer's hand. Mother and son exchanged a glance, a curious glance of strength and dread. I thought, what matter to them if Franz Ferdinand dies? One of them said, this might be serious. Yes, you're right, the other answered, it really might. John and I were married. England then had been a week at war, and all the men wore uniform as English people can, unconscious of it. Percy was best man. We went down to Devon in a warm summer rain, knowing that our happiness might never come again. I, not forgetting till death us do part, was outrageously happy with death in my heart. Lovers in peacetime with 50 years to live have time to tease and quarrel and question what to give. But lovers in wartime better understand the fullness of living with death close at hand. 
My father wrote me a letter. So, Susan, my dear, the letter began. You've fallen in love with an Englishman. Well, they're a manly, attractive lot if you happen to like them, which I do not. They have their points. They're honest and brave, loyal and sure, as sure as the grave. They make other nations seem pale and flighty, but they do think England is God Almighty. And you must remind them now and then that other countries breed other men from all of which you will think me rather unjust. I am your devoted father. John read the letter with his lovely smile. Your father has a vigorous English style, and what he says is true, but I say I'll make him like me yet someday. I settled down in Devon when Johnny went to France. Such a tame ending to a great romance. Two lonely women with nothing much to do but to get to know each other. She did, and I did too. I think I shall remember always until I die her face that day in December when in a hospital ward together she and I were writing letters for wounded men and dying, writing and crying over their words, so silly and simple and loving Suddenly looking up, I saw the old vicar moving like fate down the hospital ward until he stood still beside her where she sat at a bed. Dear friend, come home. I have tragic news, he said. She looked straight at him without a spasm of fear, her face not stern or masked. Is it Percy or John, she asked. Percy. She dropped her eyes. I am needed here. Surely you know I cannot go until every letter is written. The dead must wait on the living, she said. This is my work. I must stay. And she did the whole long day. Out of the dark and dearth of happiness on earth... Out of a world inured to death and pain, on a fair spring morn, to me a son was born, and hope was born. The future lived again. And John came home on leave, and all was joy and thankfulness to me, because my boy was not a baby only, but the heir, heir to the Devon Acres, and a name as old as England. Somehow I became almost an Englishwoman, almost at one with all they ever did, all they had done. And Lady Jean gave to the child and me the empty place in her heart. And I would hear her say, No, I admire Americans. My daughter-in-law was an American. Thus she would well repay the debt, and I was grateful. The English made life hard for those who did not come to her aid. They must come in in the spring, they would say. Wilson's pro-German, I'm told. All they care for is gold. What if the Germans some night sink an American boat? Darling, they're too proud to fight. What could I do but ache and long that my country, peaceful, rich and strong, should come and do battle for England's sake? What could I do but long and ache? And at last, at last, like the dawn of a calm, fair day after a night of terror and storm, they came. My young, light-hearted countrymen, tall and gay, looking the world over in search of fun and fame, marching through London to the beat of a boastful air, seeing for the first time Piccadilly and Leicester Square, all the bands playing over there, over there, send the word, send the word to beware. And as the American flag went fluttering by, Englishmen uncovered. And I began to cry. Bad news is not broken by kind, tactful word. The message is spoken now, the word can be heard. The eye and the bearing, the breast make it clear. And the heart is despairing before the ears hear. I do not remember the words that they said. Killed, do I, November... I knew John was dead. Nanny brought up my son as his father before him, austere on questions of manners, habits, and food, nobly yielding a mother's right to adore him, thinking that mothers never did sons much good, bringing him up much better than I could do it, 
teaching him to be civil and manly and cool in the face of danger. And then, before I knew it, the time had come for him to go off to school. Later than many, earlier than some, I knew the die was cast, that war must come, that war must come. Night after night, I lay stealing a broken heart to face the day when he, my son, would tread the very same path that his father trod. When the day came, I was not steeled, not ready. Foolish, wild words issued from my lips. My child, my child, why should you die for England too? He smiled. Is she not worth it if I must, he said. John would have answered yes, but John was dead. Is she worth dying for? My love, my one and only love had died, and now his son asks me, his alien mother, to assay the worth of England to mankind today. I thought of my father's deep traditional wrath against England, the red-coat bully, the ancient foe, arrogance, ignorance, folly are here today. Rulers of England, for them must I send out my only son to die? And then, and then, I thought, were they not English, our forefathers? Never more English than when they shook the dust of her sod from their feet forever, angrily seeking a shore where in his own way a man might worship his God. Never more English than when they dared to be rebels against her. That stern, intractable sense of that which no man can stomach and still be free, writing, when in the course of human events, writing it out so all the world could see whence come the powers of all just governments. The tree of liberty grew and changed and spread, but the seed was English. I am American bred. I have seen much to hate here, much to forgive. But in a world where England is finished and dead, I do not wish to live. And in a world where freedom and democracy are dead, none of us wishes to live. America and England are allies today. We are one with Russia and China and all the other free allied countries fighting in the same cause for the same freedom... Our fighting men have answered their call. We at home must answer ours. It's the war bond protocol. It has been sounded throughout the nation in every state and every county and city and town and farm. One dollar of every ten must go into the war chest of our country, invested in United States war bonds. Every one of us must make plans now to meet each individual quarter, ten percent of all income, all of it from every source. Put one dollar out of every ten you get into United States war bonds. Remember, this is your country. Keep it yours. The United States Treasury Department thanks the distinguished artists who gave their talents to this transcribed performance. Miss Lynn Fontaine and Mr. Henry Hull, Miss Alice Dora Miller, for the scenes or the use of scenes from the White Cliffs of Dover, and this station for the use of its facilities. The orchestra and chorus are under the direction of Al Goodman. Additional lighting by Malcolm Meacham and Violet Atkins. Production by Willie May Bates. This is Larry Elliott speaking. <laughs>